This is Comic Picks by the Glick. Hey, and I'm your host, Jason Glick. Hey, John, how's it going? Oh, good. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's like I'm like I'm still recovering from from the event that was Comic Con, and I'm like I'm busy posting all the uh, all my thoughts on my on my adventures there for like on the website. But no, tonight no, it's not going to be about like what I what I bought there because I'm still I'm still digesting a lot of that stuff. Yeah, figured you would be by now. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's like I've got like, yeah it's like I've, I've like I, I mean, there's plenty of potential stuff I could talk about. I mean, I could talk about stuff I got from Sergio Aragonas, um, creator of Gru. I got, I met, I met him. I got him to sign um his his latest comic. I met oh. Stephen, and I'm surprised how that guy always remembers like Stephen from um, Fanfare Opponent Mon. I'm always surprised how that guy remembers me from year to year. Mm-hmm. I got some more stuff from here, and, and like he's an awesome character. And um, just you know, seeing like seeing Garth Ennis in person, asking him a question, all it was great. And it gets fantastic. I mean, like I even I even managed to get my tickets for, for next year too. And that was a that was a real adventure after getting to get into the line around four a.m. in the morning. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, well, it's like I'm yeah. Go on. Uh, no, no, no. Um, Sergio Anagronis, he's been a he's been a regular of Comic Con for years, right? Um, oh oh yeah, yeah. It's like he's yeah he's he has his panel with him his his writing partner, a Mark Varnier, mm-hmm. and um they all, they do the quick draw panel and I. Quick, I went there again this year, and like Quick Draw is basically Sergio Aragonis and like two other cartoonists, two other talented cartoonists. But whenever you um, like listen to what Mark has him draw, basically it's just Sergio just basically schools schools whoever's whoever else is on with, with him and the like on the panel. I mean, it's, the man is just like insanely fast and mm-hmm. insanely fast and insanely creative. He's well, it's a joy to watch him. At work. Uh, he wrote for Mad Magazine, so I mean, <laughs> I don't yes. remember how often they published that puppy, but I imagine he had to get that crap out quick. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like and yes, yeah, it's, it's it's yeah, it's it's fantastic. The scene in action, as well as reading his um, autobiographical stuff in his his newest um, series, Sergio Aragonas Funnies, and the copy of Dark Horse's um, autobiographics, where he he tells the story of how he met Richard Nixon. Wow. So, wow. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's like I look forward to seeing like definitely more stuff from stuff from him. But like the point is, like I'm still digesting all the stuff, and you know maybe maybe I've got a, like a like a podcast on like Jonathan Hickman's work, which I'm I'm reading through his read through what I, his Fantastic Four and paperback, and I've got two of his um creator owned titles from Image. I've got at um you know, more um worse like single issues and a trade paperback of Usagi Yojimbo. I've got um a grip of like Mar- Marvel and DC stuff. That I found in there, it's like, I mean, there's tons of stuff in here that I'm sure I'll like burn through at some point. But basically, what I'm, when, but then I realized that you know, like before I left for Comic Con, I still had all this shit that um I hadn't gotten around to reviewing yet. So I, but so so while I'm thinking like you know, okay, what am I gonna do for com- for um for this podcast? I've got all the stuff from Comic Con, but I haven't read it. But I've also got all this stuff that I haven't gotten around to reviewing yet. What am I gonna do? Oh wait, I'm just doing a podcast. Recapping all the stuff that I have yet to review, just burn through all that stuff instead of just going in and writing, writing it up online. So this, basically, this is going to be one huge catch-up podcast for me. So, so really, just to get to get things started, I'm going to talk about um, the latest latest thing from Garth Ennis, and this is um, the hardcover edition of his Battlefield series from Dynamite. Now, I've done a podcast solely on Garth Ennis's on um, War Comics before. And where I even talked about his work on battlefields, and I'm pretty sure I mentioned the fact that if I had known the fact that um, those three battlefield comics he did previously were going to be collected in a giant hardcover edition, I would have waited for that hardcover edition. Now, now the Gar- now that um, he's done a second series of battlefield comics, I waited for the hardcover edition. So I've got, so I've basically got all three, all three of the stories: Motherland, Happy Valley, and the Firefly and His Majesty, all in one volume. Now. Because I'm going through a lot of titles here, I'm just going to say that you know these series, it's good. It's not really any necessarily any better or worse than um, what Ennis has done previously with war com- with his war comics. I mean, I like the fact that the that Motherland is a continuation of Night of Night Witches and she focuses on the main female fighter there and how she um, acclimates to um say to um, combat in the it's like in the regular regular Russian Russian Air Force. And I definitely definitely like to see more of that more on that in a second. And um, Happy Valley is a story is is also a story of like um, how Ennis like discovered like a um, like a bombing song um, song sung by bombers in the English Air Force as well as the uh, 
uh, the uh, the Australian um like um contingent of, of pilots who like you know even though they were um like in Australia they were still recognized English England as the motherland they how they um fly fly this these ongoing missions over this um bombing missions over this um target called Happy Valley but never seem to actually really make any progress in it and the Firefly and His Majesty is basically the continuation of the Tankies um arc from like from his previous series now that like I said I, I thought the Tankies was kind of the most um. I don't, I don't know, like um, like loosely focused of the uh, original Battlefield series, but this one, like I said, I think was better. Even though I, like, even though I think the ending was probably just probably definitely too harsh for its for its own good. That being said, um, um, if you like Ennis's War Comics, it's still worth picking up, especially in hardcover format, because Ennis does something that I absolutely love. At the very end of um each of the book, he goes on, he talks about the. He um, has an after where he talks about the origins and the inspirations regarding the research he did for each series. Now, I wish every trade paperback I read had something about had something where the where the writer or even the artist talks about their inspirations for what for for, for writing the story. And I and God knows that this this, this um, supplemental material makes makes this a worth a worthwhile purchase like for for me. So I love it, and um, it also heartens me to hear that um, that at his panel, Ennis. I'm talked mentioned that there is going to be another Battlefield series where he will continue the story story of Motherlands and on um, the Firefly and His Man- Majesty. So I'm looking forward to, the, to, to that sometime next year. Now, also, um, and this also contributes his words to a, a quote on the back for a, for another dynamite work. Not something he had anything to, to do with, but it's a European work from the, from, from Matz, the creator of of the Killer. Which, if you haven't read it, fantastic stuff about a but a, but a hitman and his um and his journey from from like from just like some um, sol- solitary insanity at w- at what he does to eventually like you know build in real life for him for him his family and just you know becoming a real person it's it's great stuff that in the way that a lot gets you to sympathize with a with an amoral killer now bullet to the head um it's basically this strikes me as to his, as his basic his take on pulp fiction because we've got because it starts off with two. Like with with two amoral hitmen just going just talking about um, shoes. It's like and the value and their value. It's like uh, one, how one guy pays two thousand bucks for his pair of pimp shoes, and they just go on about about that. I mean, it's like it's full of um like like real conversational dialogue. And you know, I I figure you know normally I'd be you'd be annoyed at like how how closely this guy apes Quentin Tarantino in terms of his conversational style. But to be honest, he. Re- Matt's does a really good job of just like making the making the uh, dialogue the ri- dialogue the rhythms in the dialogue just seem just seem really natural and and not you know just like oh I'm, like look at me how, see how clever I am, clever I am type type stuff I mean it's it's fun to see his characters interact and it's and just like the killer it's it's I love seeing how his like um how he gets you to sympathize with uh, um the like characters that you just normally wouldn't. Like care about it, just like these with these hitmen and these cops, and the story itself is basically about these these cops like who events to investigate these um the, like murder this, this murder this one senator type um by these hitmen and the hitmen investigating the fallout um like in in regards to their end. Now it becomes more interesting when uh, halfway through the volume, like a surprise twist basically puts um puts one of the one of the ki- one of the cops and one of the one of the hitmen um together to um, find out what's happened. It's like what's really going on, and it's like, and even though like the ending feels a bit rushed, I mean, it's still like a really, really cool crime story that I would go ahead and recommend to anyone, especially um, just, especially if you're, I mean, if you're already a fan of Matt's work on the Killer, this should be a no-brainer to pick up. But um, it's still, but overall, it's still like a really, really great crime story for, and a great introduction to Europe, European comics. Now, as far as crime stories to go, um, I also got the uh, latest on um, Vertigo Crime. On trade, um, call it hardcover. Um, Cowboys by Gary Phillips and Brian Hurt. This is a story of um, of let's see, of two law enforcement agents. Um, Deke Cotto, a uh, it's like a, a cop, it's like a cop on the street, a cop on the streets who want and let's see, what's this guy's name? Tim Brady, who is a who's an F- FBI agent who b- both wind up um investigating this one. Let's see, let's see, um, let's see this one this one crime crime racket headed up. Headed up by both by both by um, hotshot 
recording agent and a uh, and a, on a, and a sleazy weir- real estate developer, and they both wind up eventually kind of, uh, meeting at the very very end. But <clears throat> unfortunately, like while there's some interesting some interesting bits, you know, about um, how Tim like starts to enjoy his time, like his time undercover as a, on the recording executive's um, dime, like more. More than he should, and it's like, you know, Deke just you know, um, like posing as an as an er, like erudite, uh, like uh, white like white collar guy. I mean, it's like it's it still feels that um, there, you really don't um, get a sense of the. It, it feels like more the whole plotting and characterization just feels more mechanical than anything else. I mean, like like these are characters that you've seen in just about any like standard like um like cops. Like like cop movie or police procedural, and ultimately it just feels kind of like that. That Phillips is kind of like just more. This is like you know, it's like um, like he's got a story in mind, and I'll admit it's like it's it's pretty it's pretty well thought out, but it still feels like he's mechanically um putting his characters through the play through their paces. I mean, at the very end, I mean, it doesn't feel like like oh like we've like we've on um, like they they're they're past cross in a gay in a in a brilliant brilliantly plotted plotted um, master plan, it's feel like he's balancing an equation at the end more than anything else. I mean, it's it's not bad, but it's just, it just feels dull more than anything else. I mean, even with um, Brian Hurt's um, really expressive art, I mean, like, I've always liked the guy's stuff um, since his work with Greg Rucka on Queen and Country, um, how he's, his work is just kind of, kind of cartoonish, but still expressive enough to make it like to make it like to make it compelling. I mean, it's not like I said, not terrible, but still probably a uh, pretty good. Another reason why like the Vertigo Crime imprint never really caught fire in the way that its creators hoped. Now, keeping on the crime trip, we've got um, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips Incognito. Now you recall that um, year before last, I said the first volume of Incognito was um, one of the best things I read. It's like I read that year. Well. Um, I, I'm not sure if I want to like, like go that far to say um, that this this volume is going to be like that good, but still, like this like um, bad influences is a is a great follow up, and and at the very end, these these are wanting more now, like almost to the point where yeah, you know, like um, Brubaker and Phillips are going to do another criminal series at this time, but still, like I kind of want to know what's going to happen to um, Zach Overkill next because. Well, at the end of the first volume, we find out that you know he he wants to try um, working for the good guys, the SOS, like a chance. But in this time, he's kind of found that you know working for the good guys is just you know, it's kind of dull. I mean, like he doesn't he, like sure he's having sex with their with one of their top operatives, but he's also but he doesn't he's not really developing any empathy for the people they're supposed to protect. He just thinks they're dull, annoying, annoying little shits who are just leading boring little lives. That changes when he winds up. Um, when like a, when an old when he winds up getting getting attacked and al- and almost killed by by a guy from the, like from from the past of his of his creator Lazarus. Now the SOS guys use this as an intent to send him undercover in order to get one of their operatives for a group called Level Nine out. Turns out this operative, a guy by the name of Simon Slaughter, has apparently gone native in it's like in in, in his in his um, undercover time with level nine. And um, they want to find out, they want, um, they want Zach to bring him back home. Native. Now, what does that mean? Native. No, I mean, so basically he's, he's a guy, he was originally um, po- like supposed to be like, you know, just like an undercover operative. Like, you know, yeah, I'm working for the bad guys, but I'm really one of the good guys. But now they're not sure if he's still one of the good guys. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. So basically, what we're doing, what Brubaker and Phillips are doing with, with Incognito, with this volume, is that they're doing another riff on what they did with with their initial collaboration, Sleeper, where that f- focused on like a on on one of the on a good guy, like um going undercover with bad guys and just find out trying to find out where his just like like where like where the line between good guys and bad guys existed. Now they're they're pushing that from the out from the outside, so showing you like what happens when one. Like when what does this look like when one of the ba- formerly bad guys go like has a chance to go back in and mix up mix it up with his old buddies, and it's interesting because like you know it turns out that um Zach's time with his like with with the good guys has actually caused him to develop empathy 
the problem is it's not empathy for the good guys. It's empathy for his for all the uh, for all the scum of the earth, the the um the killers, the killers, rapists, all the all the nasty guys that he used to work with, and just and it's 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 fascinating seeing how he how he regards his old life, and um, it's like really just how how little it's like what his, what his guy his team had to offer. Now it's, it's great stuff, but the um but still the end the end like I said leaves me wanting more, especially in the sense that. You know, like it seems that we're we're also heading for another like um, reexamination of former ground. Like um, when um, Ed Brubaker took over Daredevil with Michael Lark, he obviously had um, Matt Murdock like in in prison and like you know just like surrounded by all these all the guys he put away who want him dead. That's kind of where we are where we are with the end of this volume. And so I'm um, I am and so I loved um, that um, the Devil in Cell Block D. It's the best part of. Of Raker's Daredevil one, sadly it was it was his first. Um, but this, but with Incognito, I mean, it's like I'm looking forward to seeing where they where they can go with that, like with that particular plot, plot there, without having to answer to you know like a larger like larger Marvel universe in in general. So it's like I know that they've got another criminal series out right now. They've even got a preview for it out in the in the back of this volume. But still, like I I want to know where like what's going to happen with Zach. So. Great, great stuff right here. Now, Incognito is part of uh, Marvel's Icon imprint, which is basically their creator-owned imprint where they use to keep their top-tier creators happy. And that's where um, that, that's also like what, where I got uh, what where Casanova um, Volume Two Gula um, comes from. This is from Matt Fraction, writer of Marvel's current um, big um, big event, um, Fear itself, as well as the um, usually very entertaining um, um, Invincible Iron Man. Um, he- like I'm um, hails from now. This now Casanova is a story of Casanova Quinn, a uh, it's like a it's like a, it's like a name or n- no, never do well who winds who who in the first volume like jumped from one universe to the other and is now it's like as I, I'm working as working with his dad um, as part of the um as part of the I'm um, super secret um like I'm like go, like um, governmental um a protection agency called called Empire now. Now, um, because now, because Mad Fraction likes certainly likes to fuck with his audience. This volume this volume begins with um, you know, after introducing us, reintroducing us to Casanova and his status quo, he basically just um finds out that you know, Cas- he basically tells us that no, that now Cas- Casanova Quinn has disappeared, and we need to find out when he is, not where, when. And we've got all sorts of like um, all sorts of crazy shit like from, from the introduction of um, like cri- like sort of. Mis- Serious power element known as element H. Um, Sasha, Sasha Lisi, the uh, six, the um, sometimes six-armed um, time traveler who was who says she's in love with him. Um, his partner, partner Kaido, and his um, his romance with the uh, the um, robot Ruby Seychelles. The uh, let's see, Doctor Topo Grosso and his um, and his life-destroying um, like movies. All sorts of crazy shit. I mean, it's it's great. It's a fun stream of consciousness, like series of I- ideas that um, you know. Some of these like stuff could just like fuel an entire series, but but it's fun that, in the way to see like how I mean, how Fraction just like um, like use, uses them up as like as throw, throwaways in his in his quest to find out what happened to Casanova Quinn after his um, sister um, has his homicidal sister has suddenly reappeared is now working for the bad guys is trying to kill his dad and. Um, as well as everything that he that he, st- that he stands for. Now it it goes and it just gets crazier and crazier like as the series goes on, but still, it, um, Fraction you know like like Grant Morrison still manages to ground his stuff in in like re- relatable human con- concerns and just like we're finding out, it's like you know, relating to like eventually like like the deaths of certain characters, like um, as well as like what, like why certain char- like. Paths like um I, sorry and um like you know as well as um, Z- um Casanova's evil sister Zephyr her romances with the bad with the bad guys um Newman Zeno's plans to take over the world all like he still manages to ground it in ways that we can actually still like care about things no matter how how crazy things get I mean like yes this is certainly like um weird and insane as all get out but but I like but still I liked it and the twist at the end. Um, well, not the end, but basically the twist regarding um, when Casanova really is, 
actually um, does expand expand the series in the sense that, well, it makes you want to go back and reread the series and go, whoa, dude, he's saying that's so that's what was really going on there. Cool. So it's good. So good stuff right there. And I'm looking forward. And the third series, um, Ativada, uh, at least I think that's what it's called, um, is coming out um, later this year. Um, so I'm looking forward to picking that up. Oh, and it also has fantastic work from. Well, the first series was done by um, done by Gary Oba, who does some great, great um, eccentric stuff with the straight lines. His brother um, Fabio Moon takes over, and it's it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, like as much as I like Ba's style, uh, Moon just has like a uh, so, like slightly loose, slightly looser style. That I think suits suits this work really well. Now. Shifting gears completely, we've got. I also got um, the final volume of Jack of Fables, the fi- spinoff from Bill Willingham's always great Fable series. Now, Jack. Now, Jack's story really came to an end um, about two volumes ago, or not really. No, his story really didn't come to an end in his series. See, Jack's such an amoral rogue and 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 jackass that he can't really be bothered to end the um, overarching conflict that was developing in his series. What Bill Willingham and um, co-writer Matthew Sturgis had to do was created the Great Fables crossover, where they had the creators, the characters from Fables, um, Big B and Snow White, and um, come over into into Jack's series and um, solve the um, encroaching problem with the, um, with the literals and the um, eventual undoing of the of reality. So they solved it, and um, Jack got away with like a like a golden horde that eventually turned him into a dragon. Yeah, that's crazy, but. For the past few volumes, the series has been following his son, Jack Frost, as he tries to become, strives to become a hero. Now, while the f- previous volume is just kind of like Willingham and Sturgis just marking time before they wind up the series, this one basically does good, do a good job of basic, of um, wrapping everything up, bringing in um, Jack, Jack Frost, Jack, Gary the Pathetic Fallacy, the Page Sisters, um, Raven, like all all the characters who have been in the series so far. But and then it basically um, gives you what I think is probably the equivalent of the final episode of Seinfeld in comic book form. Now, I've never seen seen the whole thing of Seinfeld, that final episode of Seinfeld. Basically, I know it involves like the characters um, after just standing idly by while someone gets robbed, thrown in jail, um, and just basically like having the concept that you know these characters are really unlikable that you're not supposed to have like like empathized with them. And then just like it's just real sour grapes treatment right there, and that's that's really the kind of ending we get for for Jack of Fables. I mean, at the at the very end, it's kind of like, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a particular ending that I don't want to don't I don't really want to give away the nature of it. But I'm just reading this and I'm just thinking, you know, it's like so I'm reading reading this all this time and that's what we get. Well, eh. I don't know. It's like I, I, I appreciate it. I mean, there was a lot of funny stuff. It has great momentum, but still. And uh, I like the bit where um, where Satan or Satans come to collect um, on Jack's soul at the end. That was handled, um, I think, pretty like pretty well. But still, it's like you know, I just kind of wish that they had shot for something more than you know than what, than what we got. Eh. Oh well. Anyway, come to the very end here and. And just just real quick, um, the the sole manga um, that I got during this time was the um, latest volume of um, Oku by Fumi Yoshinaga. You all know that I love this series, and this volume is you know it's ab- absolutely fucking spectacular. I mean, it's just another another great great finished volume in this in the series of um, showing out how um, a- how um, ancient that reca- recasts ain- like um, feudal Japan as a matriarchy after the um, red face box destroys most of the um, most of the male population, and this one, this one like takes you takes us through the uh, the death of the current death of the current um, uh, shogun, and then um, then and on to the the, reign, the short-lived reign of the next. And there's all sorts of like all sorts of sex, um, behind-the-scenes plotting, murder. It's like, and it's just it's it's really really well done. And I know that volume seven is out in Japan. Right now, and there's no specific data as to when it's going to be hitting over here. But as soon as that, that volume seven comes up, I am I am on that like white on rice. So that's 
all I read, well, that's all I had to um, offer before the uh, before I went to Comic Con. So now that that's done, I can just move on to, to talking about all all the shit that I I, I read at Comic Con, and um, like at some point, either probably just making a few podcasts out of it, as well as just talking about. You know what I? It's like just, just making the regular pop, post about it. I will say, however, that I do I have thoroughly enjoyed Jonathan Hickman's um, work on Fantastic Four, and I, I am er- eagerly awaiting the point at which his um, the, um, the volume three um, hits paperback. So, on that note, it's like it's like I said, it's uh, tying off the stump right right now, and we are going headlong into the future um, with like start starting tomorrow, which I'm sure I will have something. You know, something written for you guys um, then. Yeah. And, uh, saying, and, yeah, and that's pretty much all it. So on that note, call it a night, and I will see you all in two weeks. All right. We'll see you next time. Later. Later.